A warm welcome to everyone to the fourth annual mistake session, formally titled A Failure Shared is Not a Failure, Learning from Our Mistakes. My name is Kari Rayner, and I'll be moderating today's program along with Tony Siegel and Rebecca Gridley. I'm speaking to you from Los Angeles, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Gabrielino Tongva peoples, to whom I pay my respects and acknowledge as the traditional land caretakers of this region. Today's session is our second virtual event and fourth annual session overall. We want to extend a special welcome to our colleagues from the Society for the Preservation of Natural History Collections. If this is your first time joining us for a mistakes event, or you'd be interested in viewing materials from past sessions or related resources, we highly recommend checking out our webpage on the AIC Learning Community. As Ruth noted, um, this, this format of the session is a Zoom meeting rather than a Zoom webinar. So we encourage you to keep your camera on if you feel comfortable doing so, uh, but please keep your audio muted while others are speaking. We do also welcome the use of reactions and the chat box in response to the presentations. Uh, as Ruth mentioned again, we will be recording the presentations today to be posted on AIC's YouTube channel. However, uh, due to confidentiality reasons, not all of the presentations will be included in the public version of the recording. We are very pleased that eight speakers will be sharing their experiences with you today. We have given our participants a time limit. So if you hear a light ding like that, uh, this is a signal to our presenters to start wrapping up their talks. Halfway through the program, we'll have an opportunity for questions and a five minute intermission. And there will again be time for questions following the end of the session. We hoped um, to spend the last half hour having a lively discussion with you, and we would love to hear your comments, reflections, and ideas. If you feel inspired to share your own mistake, you're also welcome to do so. And this final portion of the program will not be recorded. As in past years, we'll be using a few fun facts provided by our speakers as introductions. So I'll be introducing first your three moderators and starting with myself. Since moving to California during the pandemic, I've been learning to surf. I've not yet attempted to stand up while catching a wave. Uh, my style at this point is more to hold on to the board for dear life, uh, but I enjoy being out on the water. Uh, my co-moderator, Tony Siegel, has developed an obsession with his lawn. He recently went in on a rechargeable mower with his neighbor, which he adores. His wife has become concerned and his new novel, Crabgrass, A Love Story, comes out later this summer. Our third moderator and co-organizer today is Rebecca Gridley, who has recently discovered she has a green thumb and she has become a voracious reader of late, but alas, mostly of picture books. She would like to recommend Anna at the Art Museum, a book suitable for anyone who needs to learn the rules for visiting a museum. It even features a visit to a secret workshop where paintings are being cleaned and repaired. And with that, I will hand it over to Rebecca to introduce our first speaker today. Thank you, Kari. Can everyone hear me? Okay, great. Um, so I'd first like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which I am standing is the territory of the Mohican, Golden Hill, Pagasset, and Wappinger peoples. I'd like to thank them for their strength and resilience in stewarding this land in Connecticut and its waterways through the generations. And with that, I would like to turn to our first presenter, Ruby Auburn, if she'd like, to, um, if they'd like to start setting up their screen. Uh, Ruby is from Melbourne, Australia, and moved to Boston for their fellowship six months before the pandemic. Early um, dur during early quarantine, they started roller skating. The type of skating they're trying to learn is jam skating, a style of roller skating developed by the Black American skate subculture evolving from the segregated roller rinks of the 1960s to have a profound impact on hip hop and rap culture in the 70s and 80s. Ruby wanted to learn a new skill in a way that would respectfully expose them to a part of the cultural landscape here that was outside of museums. So Ruby, please take it away. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, G'day everyone, I'm Ruby. Um, and I'm presenting today from Cambridge, Massachusetts. And I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional stewards on the land on which I currently live and work. Um, the Harvard Art Museums uh, acknowledges that Harvard University is situated on the traditional and ancestral territory of the Massachusetts people, and we strive to honor this relationship. 
Um, Albert Moore's study for blossoms was brought to the Strauss Center due to its tenting crack pattern. Uh, the painting is an oil study for the large scale near life size painting blossoms and at, uh, that's held by the Tate and at the right they're juxtaposed to scale. Curatorial fellow Dr. Sophie Linford and I have been researching Moore's materials and techniques using technical analysis of the painting, primary source research and experimental art history. For today's mistake session, I wanted to discuss how I plan to treat the cracks, the adverse reaction that occurred and how that scare caused me to reflect and um, change my treatment aims. I think as an emerging conservator, uh, material mistakes or adverse reactions are really uh, particularly horrific. And I hope that by sharing this, I can inspire some solidarity and confidence in my fellow emergees. Uh, mistakes happen. And understanding their cause and problem solving their resolution are skills in our toolkit from training, even if they do make you feel dreadful. Um, so this, this is the uh, cupping crack pattern on study for blossoms depicted in raking light. So these open and tented crack patterns extended um, to the turnover edge and through the thick ground. The treatment began with technical imaging and analytical investigation. Um, then the painting was surface cleaned the edges consolidated and filled and the varnish removed. When it came time to treat the cracks, I felt like I had everything figured out. I had based the treatment on this article by Jerry Headley and Caroline Villas and others from the 1990 ICOM meeting. I had enthusiastically made a miniature suction plate to be used in combination with a warming mat that was controlled by a digital thermostat and damp folding paper to lightly warm and humidify the paint. Uh, is and glass was to be encouraged um, into the painting with the suction from the plate and heated with a miniature spatula to plasticize the paint and lay it flush with the canvas. Despite rigorous and successful testing and everything working in theory, when I began to treat a larger crack in earnest, the paint layer blanched. The medium had broken down, uh, exposed, uh, leaving exposed pigment on the surface. Well, I had a panic. I took a deep breath and I put my little suction plate back into my tabaret. My supervisor, um, Kate Smith, alleviated my anxiety induced nausea with supportive words and a kind response. Um, I had researched and tested and despite all of that, a reaction had occurred. Of course, blanching is a possibility. Uh, blanching is known to occur on paintings kept in a humid environment or undergoing conservation heat treatments. An, inter uh, an interesting observation to note that was when I was testing in the background brown of the composition, blanching didn't occur. It was only uh, when I went into the figure's drapery in earnest that um, a reaction happened. So trying to um, find a reason why only the drapery blanched, this paper from 2015 suggests that paint composition, such as the nature of pigments and the presence of dryers, predispose the paint layer to blanching if exposed to appropriate heat and moisture. So now I had a different problem to solve. Is it possible to reform blanched oil paint? Yes, according to this article in Studies in Conservation from 1972, Herbert Lank, who would go on to become the first director of the Hamilton Carr Institute in 1974, writes about a painting which had blanched significantly underneath the varnish due to water damage. Um, he had successfully reformed the blanched oil paint by suspending muslin soaked in DMF or dimethylformamide over a painting in a mesh contraption for various exposures. Could I use solvents to reform the blanched oil on study for blossoms? Um, I would just take a moment to note that while this sounds like Pettenkopper's process, I did not consider using solvent vapor or um, copavia balsam. The risks of swelling of components was considered and testing was made easier due to the absence of the varnish. Using a small paintbrush, I tested most of the solvents mentioned in the article, acetone, ethanol, diacetone, alcohol, and time various applications. And finally, I tested DMF. And I tested DMF last as it's a highly toxic solvent. Um, and despite being equipped with a respirator mask and exhaust trunks and appropriate PPE, I wanted to trial all other options first. And it reduced the blanching. Um, this was confirmed under the microscope, noting that the paint surface had again become darker in color and smoother in texture. 
uh, resembling the appearance of the unaffected paint surrounding it. So I used um, the small paintbrush to slowly and carefully and in very small sections, administer DMF directly to the surface to reform or melt the paint. And this is the result. Um, but pausing on the treatment of the cracks, I returned to my research partner and began to investigate potential causes of these raised cracks, specifically in relation to this study. Uh, there are multiple research rabbit holes that Sophie and I have fallen into, um, both art historical and material, and a number of these have been born out of researching the origin of these cracks. And we found plausible cause for the pat pat. Da -da -da. We, we found plausible cause for the crack pattern that relate to the painting's creation. And this supplemental archival information allowed us um, to view the cracks and appreciate them in a different way. Does a painting need to be flat to be read as a painting and appreciated, especially if the deformation is caused by original materials and techniques and is stable in its current state? Are we used to thinking of the flattened wax resin lined paintings in museums as the visual standard of what we are aiming to achieve? Um, the thick lead brown layers are unlikely going to be softened by moisture and heat. The paint layers are stably adhered to the canvas, which is in plain and appropriately taut. Um, there are no structural issues to justify a major intervention like lining. Um, and upon reflection, the primary purpose of flattening flattening these cracks was in the affinity um, for a flat painted surface. Was this my mistake? So I proceeded to move forward without flattening them flush. With the varnish removed, I retouched the obvious wide and darkened cracks. Um, in ambient light, the cracks do not visually distract the viewer from Moore's harmonious composition and carefully chosen colors. As a leader of the aesthetic movement, I'm sure Moore would have appreciated my inner philosophical discussions about aesthetics, form function, and how a painting should look. Uh, in the end, the reason the painting came to the lab and my grand plans of flattening these cracks did not come to pass, and that's okay. Uh, learning about the artist's materials and process in combination with a slight scare reassured me um, that in this case, the cracks could be valued for what they were. Materials age after all, and study for blossoms is stable and legible considering her 140 years of life. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ruby. That was uh, terrific. Uh, I'm going to uh, introduce Diana Galantes uh, video, which she pre-recorded because she couldn't be with us. Um, uh, Diana uh, uh, lives uh, next to an incognito WWE wrestler who says, quote, she does live video production, unquote. <clears throat> Diana, quote, fixes old junk, unquote. She also enjoys when sales reps mansplain about HVAC systems. Diana has a long-standing date with her daughter at Disney Archery Club, uh, hence the pre-recorded video. Uh, so thank you, Diana. Hello, my name is Diana and I made a mistake. Here is my true confession. 10 years ago, when I was a young, a young and inexperienced objects conservator, I did a fellowship at the Harvard Art Museums. I had been suffering from imposter syndrome because I had so little practical skills doing ceramic treatments. And we all know that objects conservators are experts in ceramic treatments. Lucky me, I thought. There was a major exhibition of Islamic ceramics scheduled for later in the fellowship year and I would get to treat a lot of ceramics. Better yet, I would learn from one of the true masters in the objects conservation field, <laughs> Tony Siegel. Spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. Tony's the worst. Here is a before treatment photo of the Fritwear Bowl with overglazed luster painting. It looks fine, right? No, it does not. It had step joints, 
some unstable joints, small losses, and overpaint that was hiding something. Tony thought it was a great, straightforward disassembly, reassembly project for a fellow. Tony was wrong. The bowl really didn't want to come apart, but eventually it was convinced after days of trying combinations of steam, hot water, acetone, acetone gel, isopropyl alcohol, acetone vapor, and methylene chloride stripper. Fortunately, the adhesive identified as an epoxy was not coming off readily. And in a few instances, there was fritwear body and glaze broken off from the opposite break edge. The shirts didn't fit back together properly with all the adhesive in the break edges. And again, water, acetone, isopropyl alcohol, and methylene chloride stripper weren't taking off the epoxy. As we know, methylene chloride is pretty nasty stuff. And in the Clean Air Act of 1990, it listed methylene chloride as a hazardous air pollutant. It had been ex used extensively in the automotive and aviation industries, and those industries were developing alternative products in the 90s. Although benzyl alcohol is listed in a patent for, um, for a paint stripper from 1916, the next instance I found of its use isn't until 1988. By the time I did my fellowship in 2011, benzyl alcohol gel was being used in some conservation labs. I had been working on these break edges for days and I was losing patience. Oh, try the benzyl alcohol gel, Tony said. And I don't remember his exact wording, but he led me to believe that it was nice and gentle. So I put it on the break edges of two of the smaller shirts, including this one, wrapped them in cling wrap and left them overnight. Dun, dun, dun. When I came in the next morning, there were dozens of tiny bits of glaze in the gel that had spalled off the fragment. No, no, no. I thought to myself, has anyone been fired from this fellowship? How do I fix this mess? And also, I am never listening to Tony again. So what had happened? It seems that the benzyl alcohol gel had swelled the epoxy, but it didn't solvate it. The epoxy apparently had a low enough viscosity that it went into the pores of the, of the fritware, and when it swelled, it popped off bits of glaze along with the ceramic body from the break edges. This seemed like a total catastrophe, but I think I went about working through the problem pretty well. I made a tracing of the fronts and backs of the two fragments on blotter paper. And as I carefully collected glaze fragments, I put them on the corresponding tracing so that I had a chance of putting them back together to back in when I reassembled the bowl. From this point on, I set up a UV booth around my stereo microscope and used scalpels to scrape off the epoxy. Boy, was that tedious. But having mapped out where so many of the fragments came from, I was able to put many of them back in place. Some glaze fragments went in while the lar larger shirts were being reassembled with B72. And some went in later and were coaxed into position along with reversible film material. So this treatment was quite a learning experience. And actually, it was pretty great to have had this project at the beginning of my fellowship, as opposed to almost any other time in my career. I had the luxury of time well before the opening of the exhibition. I had a supportive supervisor and curator. And my salary wasn't based on productivity. In retrospect, I would have tested the benzyl alcohol on only one break edge of only one small fragment. I am now definitely aware of some of the challenges of ceramics conservation, and I don't assume that, work, that what works safely on a past project will work safely in the future. I also am very careful to consider the porosity of a ceramic body, especially when removing adhesive. 
because I could have a very different issue with a porous fruitware than with, say, a porcelain. And one more thing. I was strongly discouraged from talking about this treatment during portfolio interviews. When I did include it, because it's a pretty lusterware with a nice outcome, I pretty much skipped over the part about the exploding plays. I understand that what happened was not ideal. No conservator wants to damage an artwork or an artifact, but I do think that I did a pretty awesome job getting through the complexities and completing the treatment. I would think that any museum employer would want to know how a conservator thinks through treatment plans based on practical past experience and how they get their way out of a pickle when a treatment doesn't go to plan. I'd like to give a special thanks to Tony Siegel who asked me to give this talk, who didn't fire me, and who has generously helped me work through subsequent ceramic treatments over the years. Thank you. Well, I guess I get to say thank you back and that that was truly a heroic response of Diana's to that situation. I'm really grateful for her uh, presenting it to us. I also want to note that Diana is willing to take questions um, that we can text to her since she's not here today. So if you have questions for her, um, please go ahead and put them in the chat box and we'll make sure they get to her. Um, Next, our next speaker is Tori Bunting. Tori has been a knitter for longer than she's been a conservator. Her favorite knitting projects include toys and Barbie clothes for her kids and sweaters for her dog. She enjoys knitting most when her dog is curled in her lap. And Tori, please take it away. In early 2018, after 25 years working in museums and a regional center, I decided to try opening a private paper conservation studio to supplement my occasional contract work in museums. I have a neighbor who owns a large 19th century mansion for his computer tech support business in a neighboring town. He had an office space available on the second floor across the hall from another tenant business. It's in this area. With a ground floor shared entrance and all on full building security system and parking. The rent seemed reasonable for the smaller room in the back northwest corner that was adjacent to a shared kitchenette and a large dumbwaiter elevator. The ground floor had a ramp entrance and an empty room for consultations and an accessible bathroom. So I began to accumulate furniture and supplies to start my business. This part was quite exciting. The room contained an oversized sturdy desk that I kept for one work surface, and I bought an adjustable height work table, stool, and desk lamp. I bought a used map size file drawer unit and another work table from a former colleague. For supplies, my biggest expense was a DSLR camera and lens. I consulted with two knowledgeable colleagues about equipment and found these used at a good price. I was fortunate to get a portable flash light system for free from my brother-in-law, but I had to buy stands for the lamps and a Wi-Fi sync system because I was afraid that using the sync cord could damage my camera. I also bought Photoshop elements for digital editing as it was more reasonable than, buying, than subscribing to Lightroom or Photoshop. My other supplies I was able to buy on Amazon, but only bought Thing. For many supplies, I only bought things as needed for jobs. The very basic tabletop micros microscope seen here was given to me by a friend who rescued it from being disposed of by a college. The computer was another expense, um, but I had none at the time. The grow lights for light bleaching was something I wanted to try and was able to return to Amazon. Some materials were given to me as gifts like the easel and the pastel set. I also received hand tools to supplement my own from a couple of former supervi supervisors who had retired. I was fortunate to have several client referrals from local museums where I had worked and was known, as well as from former classmates working privately, regionally, and from friends, both, both personal and professional. 
I found that I was quite interested in the advertising aspect of building my business, designing a website, um, ordering marketing materials like a pamphlet, business cards, poster and banner, and using these products to advertise at my local town day booth. Of course, there were less fun elements to establishing a business, signing a lease, getting an employer identification number from the IRS, getting a business, business permit from the town, and getting insurance. I'm fortunate to have a friend with a successful painting conservation business in New York City who advised me on insurance and also shared her treatment proposal to contracts for me to copy the standard language for liability coverage with clients. The bottom line was that I was unhappy working alone. Once I had clients at work, I found that I did not enjoy working in the space alone. I missed the camaraderie of coworkers, the give and take over treatment discussions, the daily conversations um, of non-work topics. My mistake was that I did not listen to the little voice inside me that knew I was not cut out to run a private practice. I do not like the uncertainty of the workflow. I do not like to sell myself and my skills to unknown people. It's like constantly having a job interview every time you meet or talk to a new client. It's expensive to pay rent without a heavy intake of business. I decided to close my business within one year of opening. It was a difficult decision and one that caused me a lot of stress, maybe more than the stress I already felt from having the business. I felt like a failure and that I had let down people who supported and believed in me. I lost a lot of money in rent payments. I was able to resell and donate much of my furniture and supplies to a friend with a paper conservation business in Vermont. I also donated some things like the map file to my kids' middle school art department. I had to offload a few unfinished treatments to area conservators, but by the time I was done, I felt relieved and content. I had learned a lot about myself. I felt like I was true to my needs, and I was fortunate to find other contract conservation work in the area museums that I found exciting and rewarding. Throughout my career as a conservator, I have benefited from the support and training from many talented and caring people. I received much advice and support and many tools and referrals from kind colleagues past and present while establishing a private practice. In the past year, I've come to realize that my life has been one of great privilege. I want to acknowledge that privilege and give my gratitude to those unrecognized people of the past who stewarded this land before European colonial settlers invaded and who subsequently labored under their rule. Their displacement and subjugation made it possible for my ancestors to thrive here. In my geographic region, the ancestral people were a confederation of Pawtucket and the Massachusetts who live here still. These include the Nipmuc Nation, the Abenaki Nation, the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe, and the Massachusetts of Ponkapoag. In addition, I acknowledge that my white privilege and that of my forebears over people of color, particularly those of African descent who are the descendants of brutally enslaved people, we have only begun to acknowledge and repair the damage to generations of lives that European colonial enslavement and genocide have wrought. Thank you, Tori. That was a great presentation. Um, I think the little voice inside of all, many of us is the source of many of the problems that we're going to talk about today and not listening to it. So I applaud your bravery in discussing kind of a bigger picture um, mistake and how you uh, navigated that. So thank you. Um, next, I'd like to introduce Bill Simpson. Um, Bill finds that working from home since March 2020 has been challenging, but working on site now three or so days a week um, is helping bring his sanity back. I think we can all uh, recognize that as well. Um, in his free time, he has an old wooden sailboat. He likes old things. 
uh, that he hopes to actually put in the water this summer. Bill is coming to us from Chicago at the Field Museum with Sue in the background. So Bill, if you can take it away. Thanks for the introduction, Rebecca. Um, I'm very pleased to speak with all of you about a shelf collapse that we suffered and uh, what we learned from it. In the late 1990s, the fossil mammal collection at the Field Museum was compactorized and it included long span open shelving with beams about seven feet long. You can see them here. Uh, at one point, we um, hosted a traveling exhibit, Extreme Mammals, and we wanted to add a few specimens of our own to the exhibit, including this massive brontothere skull weighing many hundreds of pounds. The way we uh, transfer things off of the shelving units is to use a scissor lift. You align the two surfaces and then just slide the object from the shelf onto the scissor lift. And that worked fine for this heavy skull and uh, it was put on exhibit. And then after the exhibit, we went to put it back onto its shelf and we aligned the scissor lift and had just started sliding the skull onto the shelf when this happened. So you can see that one end, the right end of this beam let go of the vertical upright. The other end is still hanging on valiantly. And then the other beam is not affected. And you can see the shelving panels that bridge the beams have fallen down here. So we were lucky no one had been hurt. The heavy skull stayed up on the scissor lift, thank goodness. <clears throat> we documented the collapse with many photographs and the preparators began repairing the damaged fossils. And then we undertook a sort of a forensic analysis of just why this shelf failed. This is, uh, these are the various parts uh, at either end of these seven foot beams. There is this flange which ex can extend in or out and it's held in place by these two bolts. So this is what it looks like when the flange is retracted. That allows you to put the beam approximately in place. And then, whoops. And then uh, when you have it in place, you loosen the nut and extend it. And this is what it looks like when the um, flange is extended and, and would engage with the vertical post. This is what the vertical post on the right side the, uh, looks like. Uh, you can see just faint, subtle markings on it. But when we looked at the end of the beam, we could see that in fact the flange was not extended out fully. Um, and if you look carefully, you can see a mark here that tells me where the nut was tightened down and I think the flange was forced inward a little bit further when the collapse occurred. But regardless, it should have been fully extended and the nut should have been in place here. This is what it should have looked like. The other end, my computer is taking over. The other end, uh, you can see the beam is valiant, valiantly holding on. Uh, the hooks had bent and even the vertical upright had bent, but it was clearly well engaged. Compare that with the right-hand vertical post, which had these almost unmarked paint surface. Um, we also learned that there are two different kinds of flanges in use, one with three hooks and one with two. Um, we did not know that previous. So we now knew what to look for. When the flange is fully extended, the hooks extend all the way through the slots and then drop down over the rim of the slot, locking the beam to the vertical post. But if the flange, flanges or if the flange is not fully extended, 
the ends of the hooks are barely into the slots. And in fact, we found five or six more instances of this. I, I inspected the entire compactor array, as you can imagine. And there were five or six instances like this, accidents just waiting to happen. However, uh, you could only inspect those uh, flanges on the posts that were in the middle of the compactor array. The ones on the end, like the one that failed, you cannot see into those flanges to see whether they're engaged or not. And so we looked into this further and realized that the bottom of the flange extends below the beam. And if it's completely engaged, there is no gap. But if it's not completely engaged, you can see a gap here, what I'm calling the tell telltale gap of failure. And so I went back to a photograph that had been taken before we moved the big skull off of the shelving unit. And I wanted to see what it looked like where the beam met the post. And indeed, there is that telltale gap. So had we known what to look for, we would have identified this and fixed it before it failed. Now we can, now we are able to do that. This inspired me to then inspect the shelving units from all of our fossil vertebrate ranges. This is what the fossil fish range looks like. It's fairly um, obvious how this one works. This is a uh, smaller load, lighter load uh, in the vertebrate paleo oversize range. Uh, this is the uh, heavier duty stationary uh, racking. And this has a little bit of a complication that we had to be careful about. There is a button which uh, you pull out and then it allows you to lift the beam up and away from the vertical unit, the vertical post. So I inspected to make sure that all of the pins, all the buttons were pushed all the way in, which would prevent a beam from being lifted up and out of its vertical post. Here's another kind of shelving that we have that uses a locking pin to make sure that uh, disarticulation does not happen. So what did we learn? Um, examine shelving carefully understand exactly how each piece works. Make sure the beams are locked into the posts. Practice taking a shelf apart and reassembling it to make sure that you know how the system works. And it also made me think about safety around heavy objects, because as I say, we're lucky that that skull didn't come down. Uh, what can go wrong? Is there another safer way? Who will be in harm's way? Would shifting someone's position around the object make them safer? And then finally, uh, we decided to arrange the specimens so that the, the heavier ones are on the lower shelves and the lighter ones are up higher. And that way, if disaster occurs again, hopefully the damage will be less than it was before. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. I have a feeling that everyone will be checking their shelving units first thing Monday morning. I hope so. <laughs> and taking them all apart and putting them back together. Um, so add that to your to-do list. Um, now we can enter a quick Q&A before we take a break. Um, I see that we actually do have one question. Uh, we have a couple questions for Bill directly in the chat box already. So I'm going to start. Um, Ingrid Newman, if you wouldn't mind unmuting and just asking your question directly. That oh, sh sure. Hi, Bill. Thank you. That that was really uh, very sobering. Um, I'm stunned. But I, so I was just wondering, did the manufacturer put together the shelving? You know, sometimes they do that when you purchase it. Or is it more a matter that like if 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 you did it on site, the instructions weren't good. I'm just trying to figure out what, um, you know, do the instructions need to be better uh, than they are or is the manufacturer? Yeah, so so uh, the, the manufacturer installed the shelves and put yeah. them where we wanted them. Um, there really weren't a set of instructions that came along with them, but I don't, over the years, 
we have occasionally moved the shelves, um, not very recently, but I do not know whether that was the original manufacturer installation or whether that was one that we had moved. But as I say, we found five or six other instances just like this. And so I think it most likely is a combination of both the manufacturer doing it wrong and perhaps us doing it wrong. Sure. No, I was just, um, I don't, you know, I, I'm just wondering because we've had, at RISD, you know, we've had lots of shelving installed and, you know, this is really important to realize that we're all fallible, right? I mean, even the manufacturer, the installer that you, that you pay presumably yeah. to install that they that we need to check it. I think I think this is a really important presentation you made. Thank you well, so much. And, and I think thank thank you for that, Ingrid. Uh, I, I think what another thing we learned was that this particular shelving design was a little more complicated and and prone mm -hmm. to error than some others that are a little more idiot proof. Here's the idiot. Well. <laughs> Well, we, we all have similar issues. Thank you so much. Thanks. Yeah. And it looks like Tori Bunting also has a question for you, Bill. Tori, if you wouldn't mind asking. Hi, Bill. I thought that was great. And your I thought your illustrations were really great to show what to do and not do or how it should look and not look. And I was wondering if you were now installing um, images and instructions in your shelving area for the different types of shelving for for present and future employees so that they could know and check if they ever needed to change anything or wanted to do a routine check the way you did tori that is an excellent idea and i'm going to do that no i had not thought to post the instructions but why not i've given this talk uh, in-house at the museum but for future uh, staff that will succeed me. Yeah, you're right. Uh, good idea. And Trina Roberts has a question as well. Okay, I'm gonna ask it um, in case Trina can't unmute at the moment. Okay. Is it possible that the weight in the center of those very long shelves causes the shelf to sag and the hooked bit of the flanges to pull up and in, i.e. that they could have been installed correctly, but over time pull themselves out. And I'm seeing in the chat that some people are saying things can move. So do you think this might have been one of the causes rather than installation? Well, let me think about that. If, if the beam is sagging a little bit, it's getting longer, a little bit longer. And it's, I would think, trying to pull those flanges out farther, not push them in. If the flange is really locked down over the rim of the opening, I mean, as you could see at the left end of that beam, it really hung on and even the, the flange bent without uh, letting go. So I, I sort of doubt that, but I'm not sure. Okay, we have time for one more question if someone wants to pipe up and then we're gonna to go to intermission. Um, I'll just mention a situation that is related that we had at our museum. Um, a uh, you know, uh, motorized lifting uh, device was used uh, adjacent to similar shelving to lift a very heavy object up to a, a high shelf. And even though there was a spotter, the corner of the lift platform hit the bottom of the same kind of beam as, as Bill showed us, and it lifted it up enough so that it came down with a boom. Oof. And I happen to know that one of uh, the conservators who's attending this was responsible for um, uh, uh, treating the porcelain bust that was broken as a re result of that. So, you know, when you're using lifting equipment around these things, unless the shelf beam has a positive lock, as I think a couple of them did that Bill showed us, you really need to be extra double careful uh, when using that kind of equipment around this kind of shelving. Yeah, I second that, Tony. So uh, our next speaker, is Skylar Jenkins. And Skylar is the current Samuel H. Kress Fellow in Archaeological Conservation at Colonial Williamsburg Foundation and a recent, recent graduate of the UCLA Getty program. 
she accidentally raised dermistid beetles species Trogoderma variabile, aka warehouse beetle, with a colleague. A small number of the larvae lived as long as four years, feasting on starch peanuts and decapitated fig beetles, of course. Uh, she is happy to share the story and photos with anyone welcome to listen. So welcome, Skylar. Thank you, Tony. Um, I just want to say I am that I'm currently located in Williamsburg, Virginia, uh, and I acknowledge that I reside on the stolen land of the ancestral Kiskiak and further acknowledge the seven federally recognized tribes and the many, many others that make up the modern state of Virginia. I continue to peacefully reside, travel, and conduct my affairs on their ancient territories and pay my respects and honor to their land and water, which I've benefited from today. Um, so the title of my talk today, as you, say, as you see, is Sherds and Shards Facing the issue. And I don't want to one up Diana's glaze loss, but here we go. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the project is the focus of my Crest Fellowship here at Colonial Williamsburg, and the goals are to clean, stabilize, research, analyze, and reassemble a fragmentary blue person urn excavated in 2014. It was excavated from various contexts within a saw pit in the south yard of the Christopher Wren building at William & Mary. The vessel itself dates to the late 17th century and is a highly delaminated earthenware, campana shaped, rope twisted handled vessel with a dark blue tin glazed body with a white decoration in a chinoiserie style known also as blue never's wear or blue person. The ceramic shards are in approximately 60 fragments and the glazed shards are in approximately 2,545 fragments. Next slide, please. So to touch briefly on the treatment that took place and led up to Prior to the incident, it has included cleaning all plus or minus 2,500 glaze shards and 60 ceramic shards, as they still presented with soil from excavation. Many of the glaze shards were preserved almost in situ and placed together, attached to blocks of soil. Those were cleaned, faced, micro-excavated, and cleaned and recleaned as necessary before being reattached to the ceramic, as you see in the video on the left. In the areas on the ceramic where the glaze was lost during excavation and was not covered by soiling, it exhibits a black staining mold-like effect seen in the images on the right. The black is present on a number of ceramic shards and presents as lines and patterns of dots indicating where some of the glazed shards original location were, a bit like a map burn effect. Using these outlines as a guide, many of the glazed shards have been able to be attached in their original location. Next slide, please. So an issue arose when realizing that the glaze recently applied using those black guidelines was actually offset from either not fully being cleaned on all the edges and or some adhesive and soiling remaining between the joints of the glaze shards on the surface of the ceramic shirt. I decided to face the section of glaze and remove it, remove it from the surface of the ceramic to reline. However, the adhesive chosen for the facing, the fact I probably didn't flush the area with enough solvent to loosen the adhesive between the glaze and the ceramic and the inherent vice of the glaze caused extensive fracturing of the glaze shards creating more misalignment and even ended up lifting part of the ceramic surface near the top edge. Next slide, please. So to give you a better idea, the sounds you hear in this video are an accurate reenactment of what happened as I was removing the facing, <laughs> except with a bit more exp expletives. Hopefully you can hear all that. Shattering of glass is what you should be hearing. <laughs> Next slide, please. So after being privileged in my position of having a few months for oh, I'll show you this, exact, which she's working on. Gina, turn off your mic, please. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, to hide my mistake in a cabinet, I regained my confidence and reassurance in myself that touching the glaze was okay now. I knew it needed to be realigned as the fracturing caused many misalignments. All of the individual fractured shards also needed to be cleaned again prior to being re-adhered to the ceramic and a different adhesive should be used to the one that was chosen, which was too strong. So this led me to shard by shard, reface the entire piece. Next slide, please. So I'm sure these are shared realizations after making treatment mistakes, but what did I gain from this experience? I know I need to own my choices and not let them sit in a cabinet for four months, uh, realize that they are salvageable and also make them a learning opportunity. Um, I should not be seeing them as mistakes. An edit from a colleague was made to the description of this talk with the word change from mistake to choice. 
And I think that is a great way to seek treatment decisions that do not go as planned. I had also been so ashamed to let my supervisor know that this mistake was made. But when I showed her, her reaction wasn't reactionary at all. And her encouragement as I have been retreating the piece has been extremely helpful to maintain my course of action. As I self reflect, as I self reflect, perhaps my response about this choice was a response I have been conditioned to do so due to past traumas. I often think about how our work is not permanent and it is meant to fail over the object. So why did I feel so ashamed to make an error in judgment? The retreatment I performed led me to realize that I needed to do the same type of refacing and meticulous cleaning of several of these larger arrangements of glaze. And I've been able to do so with gained confidence from this choice. And it has better prepared me for time management as I finish up the treatment within the next few months. Next slide. So thank you. Thank you all for your attention and thank you to the organizers for starting this session four years ago.